Good morning, good morning. It's good to see you. Come on, stand up. Let's worship the Lord together this morning. And wonder on 
that day when time is over And every heart at last broke How worthy is your name Oh God, the glory is yours The kingdom is come and the battle is over Jesus, in your name we rise And the glory is yours The glory is yours Oh God, the glory is yours The kingdom is come and the battle is over you there has never been anyone or anything like you nobody beside you there has never been anyone or anything like you nobody beside you there has never been anyone or anything like you nobody beside you there has never been anyone or anything like you Jesus, in your name we rise, and the glory is yours, the glory is yours, oh God, the glory is yours, the kingdom is come, and the battle is over, Jesus, in your name we rise, and the glory is yours, the glory is yours, nobody beside you, there has never been anyone or anything like you, nobody beside you, there has never been anyone or anything Good morning, church. Welcome to Three Rivers Church. You're visiting with us. And uh, if this is strange to you, I really encourage our church to clap or to cheer or to say amen uh, as the Spirit leads you. I don't need you to fake that. We, We are in the middle of football season. Some are super excited. Some could care less because it's just we're all wired different. Uh, At my school this week, we decided to celebrate the opening of football season by letting teachers wear jeans and a jersey or their school shirt, and some of them really were excited, and they had a few that were like, well, what do I wear? I don't like football. There's lots of things you can wear. Uh, But I want to encourage you, there's something far more glorious than football. We have, we forget things. I was talking to Pastor Ian uh, right before we came in here. He's like, remind me what I was supposed to be doing. Do you remember? Uh, You ever walked into a room or forgot why you were even in the room? You were going to get something, and you asked other people, like, what am I in here for? And they look at you like, I don't even know what I'm in here for. So we tend to forget. So I remind us that we are here for a reason this morning. And you may have forgotten. You may have come here out of habit. Someone may, may have drugged you here. You may have come here, but there's a reason you're here, and it is to worship Jesus Christ. There was a time when we were lost, but now we're found because of our faith in Christ. We were blind, but now we see because of our faith in Christ. And we come together this morning to worship together. And if you're visiting with us, that's why we're all gathered here today. We have a communication card. We'd love to know more about you. If you're looking for a church home, we'd love for this to be your church home. And we want to know how to connect with you. And uh, if you're a church member and you've got things that have changed or information or questions, you can use this as well. And on the back side, as a reminder, we always encourage you to uh, put your prayer request on here. Amen? And uh, we're here for one reason today, and it's to worship. But we get to do something really special. We get to worship Jesus together. And the strength of that worship, no pressure, it comes from what we've been doing on our own. So I hope that all this week that you've been worshiping the Lord in your personal life. Hope that you've been active in your prayer. Hope that you've been in his word, because when you have been doing all those things faithfully, you bring about good fruit for corporate worship. 
If you're ever in a room or a church and it feels kind of dead, it's probably because the individual parts and pieces aren't quite where they need to be in their personal walk. Are we ready to worship? It don't matter if you're ready or not. The Holy Spirit will guide and lead and direct us, and we will. Amen? And then we're going to open up God's Word, and we are going to dig in. And there's going to be some things that the Holy Spirit teaches us today that we don't want to hear, but we need to hear. There's going to be things that we're going to love to hear, like, yes, I'm, I'm doing that well. And there's going to be some things that we have no clue about. But then we get to leave this place and go out into a very dark, lost world and be the light of Christ. What a wonderful place that we're in. What a wonderful lot that the Lord has given us. Father, we come before you in prayer. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord, it's by his blood that we've been healed and made whole, and that it's by his blood that we have an avenue to be reconciled to you, to be known as children of the Most High God. And Lord, you have given us such a great mission. Lord, we want to grow up and mature in you today. Lord, thank you for those that are serving you this morning, uh, watching children and teaching children and greeting people. And Lord, thank you for those that are so faithful in their giving and are settled in their heart that they don't even worry about. They're just excited to give, whether it's time or money. Lord, we thank you for so richly providing for us. And as a church, Lord, help us to be a part of growing your kingdom, both here and across the world. And Father, we give our full attention to you right now, our hearts, our soul, our mind, our strength. We worship you and your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.
Your name is a light that the shadows can't deny. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name is a light forever lifted high. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name is a light that the shadows can't Never 
the day he comes in glory to reveal the fullness of his reign all hearts will bow before the sound of jesus name oh the cross of jesus christ is the Shall not kneel, shall not pay by his. 
make no promises. Come on. Not good. Well, this morning, as we continue in our journey through John's gospel, we, we return to chapter 18, where we'll be picking up at, uh, at verse 15. Last week, we, we saw that Jesus, after leaving the upper room where he, he shared a final meal with his disciples, he, he led them away to a garden to pray. And remember, uh, Judas has, has already left before this, after the meal, after Jesus had washed the disciples' feet. Jesus, knowing what Judas was going to do, knowing that Judas was going to betray him, he sent him away, uh, and he told Judas, uh, what you do, do it quickly. And so Judas has left, and then Jesus, he spent the remainder of the evening with the, with the rest of the disciples, those remaining 11, in, in what was a very special, very intimate time where he, where he taught them, where he shared his heart with them, where he prayed for them, he encouraged them. And, and then, as we open chapter 18, Jesus led these 11 faithful to the Garden of Gethsemane, and, and it's here where the betrayal takes place. It's here that Jesus is arrested and carried away. He was approached by the chief priest and the Pharisees who were accompanied by, by Judas, of course, and a, and a Roman cohort. That's a Roman military unit that would have consisted of at least 200 men. Could have been as many as 600, but at least 200 men. And, and Pastor Ian, he painted this picture for us last week, if you remember. He was, he was talking about this. And, and can you envision it? Jesus, 
who's never demonstrated any kind of, of, of violence. He's there with his 11 disciples. So it's 12 dudes, right? And they're, they're out here in the garden. And these religious leaders, they come after Jesus with a military unit of at least 200 men who are carrying torches and lanterns and weapons. And as Ian was talking about that scene, what I visualized in my mind was the scene from Beauty and the Beast where Gaston is, is, is leading the mob of people to the castle to capture the beast. Yes, I've got kids. Uh, but, but, but Jesus, he's, he's led these, these 11 guys to the garden to pray. They've been approached by Judas and these religious leaders with this military unit. They've arrested Jesus, they've bound him, and they've carried him away, taking him to Annas, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest. And that's where we left off last week, there at verse 14. Today we pick up at verse 15. So let me go ahead and ask, do you have your Bible this morning? Good. Please open it if you haven't already and look there with me to John chapter 18, verse 15. That's John 18, where we'll be reading verses 15 through 27. Are you there? I hope so. All right, look with me. Read along with me there, beginning John chapter 8, verse 5, John chapter 18, beginning at verse 15. It says, Simon Peter was following Jesus, and so was another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter was standing at the door outside. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. Then the slave girl who kept the door said to Peter, You're not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slave and the officers were standing there and having made a charcoal fire, for it was cold, and they were warming themselves. And Peter was also with them, standing and warming himself. And the high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teachings. And Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I spoke nothing in secret. Why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the officers standing nearby struck Jesus, saying, Is that the way you answer the high priest? And Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify of the wrong. But if rightly, why do you strike me? So Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, I am not. And one of the slaves of the high priest, being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied it again, and immediately a rooster crowed. Father, we, we do come to you now, Lord, and just ask your multiplied blessings on our time together. Bless the reading of your word. Bless the proclamation of your word. And God, I pray that you would touch me. I pray that you would give me clarity of thought, clarity of mind. That, Lord, I would speak nothing but truth, the truth of the living God, that our lives would be changed by it, that we would be challenged, that we would be molded, Lord, that we would find the places where we may need to repent in our lives. Well, whatever it is you want to do in us today, God, do the work through the power of your Spirit moving in this place. And we'll thank you for everything that you have done. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said together. Has anyone here ever been mistreated? Ever been falsely accused? Slandered? Lied on? Gossiped about? course you have we, we we all have this is an experience that we all share this is sadly an unavoidable part of, of living in this fallen world injustice is inevitable inevitable because of the sinfulness of mankind and, and sooner of late sooner or later everyone will be mistreated in some way it, it's just it's going to happen this is an experience that we all share but the fact that everyone faces this doesn't make it any easier to endure when it comes for you. Right? Mankind, we are made, we, we, we are the pinnacle of God's creation. We are God's masterpiece. We, we are the only thing in all of creation that was made in God's own image. We are his representation on the earth. And, and God... God is a God who requires justice. 
Yes, God is loving, he is kind, he is patient, and thank God that he is loving and kind and patient. But just as much as he is those things, God is just. And man, being made in God's image, we have this inherent nature that longs for justice. We long for right to prevail over wrong. That's why we love those movies, right? It all seems hope is lost, but in the end, right prevails. That's, that's what we long for is it's ingrained into us. And this is especially true when it's something that directly impacts us, right? We don't want to be mistreated. And if we are, we, we, we don't want the one who did the mistreating to get away with it. We, we, want, we, we want justice, even though we're not perfect, even though we know that we make mistakes, even though that we, we, we sometimes say things that we shouldn't say, and sometimes we do things we shouldn't do. We are, we are all guilty of doing wrong, and if we're honest with ourselves, we have to admit that. We're, we're all guilty of doing wrong. So even though we know that we're guilty, that we're not perfect, that we all done, we've all done wrong, we don't like to be talked about, we don't like to be judged, and we sure don't want to be mistreated. We want grace. We want understanding. We want compassion, right? Sidebar, why don't we not offer that to the others if that's what we desire for ourselves? Why are we so condemning, so judgmental to other people when all we want for us is grace and compassion and understanding? When we're all in the same boat, we all mess up. We all need grace and compassion and understanding, but if we are mistreated by someone, we want justice, right? And sometimes we want justice even when it's not us that's been mistreated. That's why you see people picketing in the streets in front of courthouses. They want justice. That's just, it's just ingrained into us. You know, Jesus, the only person in the history of the world to live his entire life without ever miss, messing up once, he never said a bad word. He never had an evil thought. He never acted in an inappropriate way. Jesus was completely sinless, completely blameless, and yet he was arrested, tried, convicted, and condemned to death. But through it all, Jesus remained calm. He didn't attempt to defend himself. He didn't try to set the record straight. He answered sincere questions directly. He spoke truth, and he spoke with dignity, and he calmly resolved to let the Father vindicate him at the proper time. And on top of all of that, while Jesus is facing all of that stuff, the remaining 11 disciples, they've all abandoned him. They, they've, they've all took off running. And one of the 11, Peter, who is, is a focal point in our text today, Peter not only doesn't stand by his Lord, but, but he completely denies that he even knows him. And that, that's the stuff that we're going we're gonna to see through the remainder of chapter 18 and, and chapter 19. As we move through these, these last few hours of Jesus' life, we, we see the betrayal, the abandonment, the denial, the mockery of a trial, the, the, the illegitimate conviction, and the brutal, unjust punishment of Jesus. You know, this would truly be a sad scene. I mean, this, th these heinous acts would truly make this scene the most awful, the most atrocious thing ever if it weren't for the plan of God and what he accomplished through it. So Jesus has been arrested. He's been carried away. He's taken to Annas, and, and that's where we pick up our story today. So look with me there at verse 15, at what it says. It says, Simon Peter was following Jesus, and so was another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest, but Peter was standing at the door outside. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. When Jesus was arrested, the disciples scattered. In Mark's telling of this scene, 
Mark says in Mark 14, 48 through 50, And Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me, as you would against a robber? Every day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures. And here's this last, this last sentence. And they all left him and fled. The disciples took off running. They scattered. They left Jesus behind. However, as they took off running, two of these guys turned back. Peter and another disciple, they returned. They didn't return to Jesus' side. They're, they're hiding in the shadows. They, they're following from a safe distance. They're, 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 they're watching to see what's going on. They're following to, to find out what's going to take place. And we're not told for sure who that other disciple was, but the consensus of Bible scholars is that it was John, the, the author of this gospel. And if that's true, why? why? Why wouldn't John identify himself here as the other disciple? Well, if you look at John's gospel, that, that's kind of the M.O. for John anyway. He, he, you realize he never directly identifies himself as the author of this book either? Nowhere in this book does he say, I, John, wrote this book. But John's identity as the author of this gospel can be discovered by putting together the pieces of the puzzle that is found in Scripture. Without diving too deep, we don't have the time to do that. If you're interested, you can certainly dig in for this for yourself, or we can talk later. But, but in chapter 21, verses 19 through 24 of this book, uh, there it identifies the author of this book as being the one whom Jesus loved. It says, the one whom Jesus loved wrote this book. There are four other places in the book of John where, the, where that distinguishing title is used. It's uh, chapter 13, verse 23, chapter 19, verse 26, chapter 20, verse 2, and chapter 21, verse 7. And this title, the one whom Jesus loved, is known to be John. Why? Well, using what we have in Scripture, not, not just here in this book, but also what we can find in Matthew and Mark, we can, define, we can find that the disciple whom Jesus loved is narrowed down to being one of the three of Jesus' closest friends. That was Peter, James, and John. It was narrowed down. It's got to be either Peter, James, and John. Now, taking that information, it's got to be one of those three guys. It obviously can't be Peter because John 21, 20 says, Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. So if Peter's walking along, turns around and sees the disciple who, whom Jesus loved following them, it can't be Peter, right? You can't turn around and see yourself walking behind you, right? So, so it, Peter's out. So that leaves us with James and John. Well, James was beheaded by King Herod in Acts chapter 12, around 44 AD. And looking at the historical content of the Gospel of John, this book would have been written somewhere around 90 A.D. or later. So James is out. Now, who does that leave us with? So John is the disciple whom Jesus loved. And by deductive reasoning, we can decipher that John is the author of this gospel, even though he never directly names himself. Now, back to the text for today. We don't know for sure that it was John uh, who followed after Jesus with Peter, but it wouldn't be unlike John to not name himself. And like I said a minute ago, but by looking at the details of Scripture, it is agreed upon by most Bible scholars that, that it was John. But, but whoever it was, he and Peter, they followed to watch and see what was going to take place. The soldiers, they've, they've carried Jesus into the court of the high priest. And the other disciple, who's a pre presumably John, well, he was allowed to follow in because, well, the high priest knew him. Apparently, they had a, had a familiar relationship. They knew each other. And so when they got to the gate, who, they were like, oh, we know John, or you know this disciple, whoever he was. We know him, we let him in. But Peter, he had to wait outside. He wasn't known. He had to wait for this other disciple to come and speak to the doorkeeper and let Peter in. See this? Look at verse 15 and 16 again. Simon Peter was following Jesus, uh, and so was his other disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter was standing at the door outside, so the other disciple who was known to the high priest went and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. 
And now Peter, he walks through the door, and as soon as Peter walks into the door, things immediately begin to go wrong. Things really take a bad turn for Peter. Look at verse 17. Peter walks in the door, and what's it say? Then the slave girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? I am not. As soon as Peter walks in, the girl keeping the door, she recognizes him. She knows he's one of the disciples of this man who they've got out here in the courtyard. So she questions him, hey, hey, aren't you one of his followers? Aren't you one of his disciples? And what's Peter say? Nope, not me. You got me confused with somebody else. Maybe it was my cousin Bill. He looks a lot like me. Not me. I am not. This is the first of, th of the three times that Peter will deny the Lord. The first of the three that Jesus predicted back in chapter 13. Move on to verse 18. Now the slaves and the officers were standing there having made a charcoal fire. For it was cold and they were warming themselves. And Peter was also with them standing and warming himself. So John tells us that there's this charcoal fire burning where, where Peter stood with these other people warming himself as he watched what was taking place. Why did John include this detail? I mean, is it really important that it was cold? Is it really important that, that, to know exactly where Peter was standing when all this takes place? Now, I, I don't know this, but I, but I think John may have included this seemingly insignificant detail to paint a picture in the mind of his readers as we, as we read this scene, to, to, to paint a picture of, of Peter standing there looking through the fire as, at his master as he denies him. Can, can you see it in your mind? It's dark. It's sometime around 3 or 4 in the morning by now. The only light is the light coming from that fire and from the burning torches around. And Peter, he's standing there in the darkness behind the fire. The, the smoke is rising up in front of him, but rising up between him and the scene that is in, unfolding as, Jesus, as, as Peter is watching, as he's denying. Can, can you see it? Later, in John chapter 21, John's going to point out the same detail again because there... There's going to be another charcoal fire burning when Jesus comes to Peter at the Sea of Galilee to restore him. And just, just as Peter denies the Lord three times here in chapter 21, Jesus will ask him three times, Peter, do you love me? And what a, an amazing scene that is, but we'll get to that in a few weeks. Now, verse 19. It says, the high priest then question Jesus about his disciples and about his teachings. Now, if you're paying attention, you'll notice that there is some seemingly conflicting information here. It, it says here in this verse that the high priest questioned Jesus. There's just one problem. Jesus hasn't been sent to the high priest yet. Caiaphas is the high priest, and Jesus is not sent to him until down in verse 24. But here we are in verse 19, and it says the high priest is questioning him. So who is this that is questioning Jesus? Who, who, who is this that is being tributed with this title of the high priest, even though he's not the high priest? Well, look back at the end of last week's text to when they arrested Jesus, and let's see who it was that he carried him to. Look at verse 12. So the Roman cohort and the commander and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him, and they led him to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Jesus is being questioned by Annas, the father-in-law of the high priest. So why, why does John refer to Annas as the high priest? Well, we need to understand who Annas was, besides Caiaphas' father-in-law, we need to understand who he was to see what was going on here. You see, in, in first century Judaism, the office of the high priest was essentially regarded with the same respect and esteem as the king to the people of Israel. This was a very esteemed position. In fact, to many of the Jews, the high priest held more respect and esteem than the king because he was the religious leader. He was, I mean, he was the head, you know, 
The Judea, Judea, Jewish people are all about the religion, about the traditions of the religion. And so the high priest, he, being, the, being the high priest was a big deal. It was a position of power. It was a, had a lot of influence. However, since the, the people of Israel were ultimately under the rule of Rome, the position of the high priest, it had to be approved by Rome, and, and the high priest governed under the authority of Rome. And we're told uh, there in verse 13 that Caiaphas is the one who is officially held, who officially held the office of the high priest. But the people know that it's his father-in-law, Annas, who was the one who was truly in power, who was the one who was pulling the strings. Caiaphas was just his puppet. Now, I know, I know that none of that goes on in our world today. We never have people of power, wealth, and influence who are controlling our political officers in our world today, but they did in the first century. You see, Annas, Annas was the one who was originally appointed to be the first high priest of the Jewish people under the rule of Rome. And rule became, uh, became over them. Annas was the first one appointed as high priest. He was appointed by the Roman governor Quirinius in AD 6. But he was later removed from the office in AD 15 by uh, Valerius Gratus when he became the governor. Now, here's the thing. Even though Annas was, was removed from the official position of the high priest, he remained very influential, and he headed a vast empire of organized corruption in Jerusalem. He and his family were known for their racketeering, known for their greed. In short, Annas ran a first century mafia. And so, even after being removed from office, Annas wielded power, and he, and he continued to run things through his son Eleazar uh, and his son-in-law Caiaphas. In fact, this family held a virtually unbroken line of secession after Caiaphas through four more sons and a grandson. This was deep-rooted, long-lasting influence and control. It lasted for many, many years. And so although Caiaphas is officially the high priest, Annas is the one who's really running the show. And the people knew this. He was just like a mob boss in the 1940s who controlled the politicians and the officials and the police. And so now we, we understand who Annas was uh, and, and we understand why Jesus was carried to him and why he was referred to as the high priest. It's more, get this, it's more than just honoring him with a title that he no longer actually holds. You know, we do that with our former presidents. When someone serves as the, as the president of the United States, they're forever known as president, you know, President George Bush, President Obama, President Clinton. They're forever known. They're always honored with that title. But, but it's more than that here because even though Caiaphas was officially the high priest, the people, including John, who wrote this book, they all understood that it was Annas who was the one who was really in charge of the Jewish religious leaders. And by the way, Annas hated Jesus. And there might be a number of reasons why, but, but a big reason, probably the biggest reason, is because that one of the things that Annas did in his organized crime and corruption ring was he held a monopoly on the animals that were deemed acceptable for sacrifice in the temple. See, Annas, he had these booths set up known as the booths of the sons of Annas. And these booths were set up uh, on the Mount of Olives and in the court of the Gentiles there in the temple complex itself. And the purpose of these booths was to exchange money and sell animal sacrifices. Do you see where I'm going with this? See, according to the law of Moses, it was the priest who determined what animals were qualified to be used as a sacrifice. And, well, Annas controlled the priest. And so people would come into the temple many, many times with a completely, perfectly acceptable sacrifice only to be told, oh, no, that's not acceptable. You can't sacrifice that animal. You're going to have to get a different one. And Lo and behold, you're in luck. We got some for sale right here. Of course, they were way overpriced. 
And you know, the Jewish historians say, you know what they would really do? Is they would take your perfectly good sacrifice from you, sell you one, and then the next person came along, they would say their sacrifice was, and they'd sell your sacrifice to them because yours was acceptable all, the, all to begin with. It was a racket. So, but that, that's what was going on here. So, so when Jesus cleansed the temple back in chapter 2, Annas took it personal because Annas was the one who was behind it all. When Jesus flipped over the tables, it was his tables. When Jesus drove the people out, it was his cronies. When, when, when Jesus scattered the money, that, that hit his pocketbook. And th this is why in Matthew's telling of, the, of Jesus cleansing the temple, Matthew 21, 22, uh, 21 verse 23 tells us that, that after Jesus drove these guys out, that the chief priests and the elders came to him and demanded to know by what authority are you doing these things? Because you see, they, and, and, and understandably so, they could not imagine anybody challenging the Annas crime family, at least not with the backing of somebody who had immense power. And when it was discovered that Jesus was acting alone, the plot began. Way back in John chapter 2, Annas begins moving. He begins working. He begins pulling strings, trying to find a way to get this man. Annas hated Jesus he wanted him dead and he wanted Jesus dead for two reasons first Jesus dared to question and even defy the authority of the high priest over the temple and secondly and of course the most important reason is because Jesus being around was just bad for business he, he's got to go and, and, and so now we know who Annas is and the role that he is playing in all of this so let's get back to the text at hand look there at verse 19 so the high priest, this is Annas, then questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. And Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together, and I spoke nothing in secret. Why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them. They know what I said. Jesus is going to go through a number of trials over these next few hours. He's going to stand before a number of people. And in the trials of Jesus, especially here before the Jewish authorities, they do not follow the established protocol of the time. Jewish tradition carefully regulated and conducted uh, uh, criminal and civil trials. And here's the thing. No trial was to be held in secret or at night but here we are in the middle of the night without making it known to the people that there was even a trial taking place at all the regulations also held that the only proper place for a criminal case to be heard was in the hall of judgment which is in the temple but where are they? they're not in the temple they're at Caiaphas' house furthermore when hearing evidence the accused could not be compelled to testify in their own case and all charges must be substantiated by multiple witnesses over the course of the trials of Jesus at least 18 regulations were broken each and every one of them was grounds for mistrial but they didn't care they were on a witch hunt who cares about procedures? Who cares about protocol? Who cares about the rules and the regulations? We've got him in custody, and we're going to put an end to him right now. Who cares if it's legit? He's got to go. When they brought Jesus to Caiaphas' house, Annas starts questioning him. And by the way, in doing this, Annas is breaking more rules when he begins to ask Jesus about his teachings and his followers. But again, he has no concern for rules. He was on a mission. He was hoping that Jesus would say something incriminating. But look at what Jesus says there in verse 20. I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues, in the temple where all the Jews come together, and I spoke nothing in secret. Why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them. They know what I said. Now, at first glance, I, I, I get it that it may seem like Jesus was being disrespectful, but, but, 
Not at all. Jesus is simply pointing out the proper procedure. The accused could not be compelled to present evidence against himself. And the presiding judge, who Annas had assumed that position upon himself now, the presiding judge was not allowed to examine a witness or an accused person himself. Their job was to sit and listen to make a judgment. He was not allowed to ask questions. Annas was all kinds of wrong here when he began to ask questions uh, of Jesus. So, so Jesus, he wasn't being disrespectful. He was just pointing out the proper procedure. And this would not have gone unnoticed. Annas would have known exactly what Jesus was doing. He would have known that Jesus was right in what he said, and this would just have further enraged him. So Jesus, Jesus says, why do you question me? I want to put an emphasis on that you, because Annas can't question him. Why do you question me? You hear the implication? You know you can't do this. You know you're breaking the rules. You know that you're not authorized to question me. Then Jesus goes on to call for witnesses, which was another requirement that, that Annas was ignoring. Every, everything that Jesus had said and done had taken place in the presence of multiple witnesses, and in many times it was in front of multitudes of people that Jesus was speaking in acting. So Jesus is like, hey, call in some witnesses. Ask, ask the folks who were actually there what I said. You see, according to Jewish custom, conflicting testimonies could not be used to condemn the accused. The testimonies must be in agreement. And Jesus knew that if they were to actually go out and question witnesses, talk to people, he knew that when they heard the testimony of people, they would not have testimonies in agreement and they would exonerate him and just point out the false testimony of these religious leaders. And the religious leaders, they knew this as well. They knew that they could not call for any real witnesses. That's why they broke all of these rules. That's why they did this in the night, in secret, without calling for witnesses, without allowing Jesus to have a chance to have a defense prepared. They had to rush through this to get it done before someone could come and point out all the rules that they were breaking and put a stop to this horrible injustice. Jesus wasn't being disrespectful. He was just pointing out what everybody there already knew, that they were doing it all wrong. And when Jesus points this out, what happened in verse 22? When he had said this, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus, saying, is that the way you answer the high priest? In doing this, yet another rule was broken. Brutality was not allowed in the courts. You can't just walk up to a witness and slap him in the face. But again, who cares about the rules right now? Rules are out the window. Don't worry about rules. So, so when, when Jesus replied to Annas by pointing out the proper procedure, one of the guards steps up and he struck Jesus. Now, some translations will say that he struck Jesus with the palm of his hand. Some clearly state that he slapped Jesus in the face. And that does appear to be the accurate description of what took place, that this guard stepped up and just slapped Jesus in the face and asked a question, is that how you answer the high priest? Basically, how dare you question him? How dare dare you tell him that what he's doing is, is what he's doing is wrong how dare you point out his hypocrisy right you can't do that but let me tell you something here is a place in scripture where you can really see the son of god in jesus because i'm telling you what if that had been me there and you just walked up and slapped me upside the head calm cool and collected would not be what you got from me But Jesus, after being slapped in the face, he maintained perfect composure. He remained perfectly calm, and he responded with, with a reasonable request there in verse 23. Jesus answered him, If I've spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if rightly, why do you strike me? If I've said something wrong, if I've said anything that's untrue, tell me what it is. Just, just tell me what I've said that's wrong. And, and, and if I haven't said anything wrong or untrue, why are you hitting me, dude? Annas has nothing to say. 
You know why Annas quit speaking here? Because there is absolutely nothing Annas can say that won't incriminate himself at this moment. Annas has been backed into a corner because he knows what Jesus is saying is right. And so in verse 24, it says, So Annas bound him and sends him to Caiaphas, the high priest. Having pointed out the fact that there was no witnesses, there was no evidence against him, that he was guilty of nothing more than allowing Annas to make a fool of himself, uh, the old high priest, he, he, he binds Jesus and he sends him away. It's obvious that Annas' questioning of Jesus was, was, was not about truth at all. There was, there was no desire to discover truth. There was only, uh, his only desire was to find a way to condemn him. And when it became obvious that he was getting nowhere with his questions, he just sends Jesus away. And now, at that, as Jesus is being sent away, the focus of the, of the scene shifts. As Jesus is being carried away to Caiaphas, the attention returns to Peter, who is still hiding in the shadows, watching all this take place. Look there at verse 25. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You're not also one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? And Peter then denied it again, and immediately a rooster crowed. In fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy, Peter denies the Lord. These are the second and third times. And just as soon as Peter made his third denial, it says that immediately a rooster crowed. What do you think went through Peter's mind when he heard that rooster? Put yourself there. Matthew, Matthew in his gospel, he gives us a look into this scene with greater detail. In Matthew 26, verses 69 through 75, listen to what Matthew says about this scene. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him and said, You too were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. When he had gone out to the gateway, another servant girl saw him and said uh, to those who were, who were there, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. And a little later, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Surely you too are one of them, for even the way you walk, uh, even the way you talk gives you away. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know the man. And immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the words of Jesus, that he, what he had said before rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. I imagine so. Just a few hours ago, Peter has boldly proclaimed that, that, that he'd be faithful to the end, that, 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 that he'd never deny that Jesus, that, that he'd die first. And now, here he is, having done exactly what Jesus told him he was going to do. He's denied Jesus three times. And not simply just denied Jesus, but according to Matthew, the second time, he, he denied him with an oath. That is, that he, he swore, I swear, I don't know this guy. And then the third time, he began cursing as he denied the Lord. Not very fitting behavior for a disciple. I bet Peter did run and cry. I bet he wept bitterly. I bet the reality really just came down on him like a ton of bricks. And, I, and I've told you this before, but, but I'll tell you again, I'm so thankful that God saw fit to include details like this in his, in his eternal word. I, I'm thankful that God shows us the reality of people struggling with their flesh, people stumbling in their Christian journey, pe people just, just, just not... Just, just not doing what they should do, showing us that, that you know, it's not about us. 
It's not about how good we are. It's not about how dependable we are. It's not about how faithful we are. It's all about him. It's about his goodness, his faithfulness, his restoring love for us. That even when we blow it and we find ourselves doing those things that we never could even imagine that we would do, things that we would just like Peter, we would boldly proclaim, I'd never do that. Let me just caution you, be careful, be extremely careful making a statement like that. Understand, there is not a single sin that you and I aren't capable of committing, not one. Just look at the example of so many people in the Bible who sinned, people who failed in, in such massive ways. And I'm talking about people who, who walked with God, people who had one-on-one -on -one conversations with God, and yet they blew it. I, I think of, of people like Adam and Eve. God walked with them in perfection and in beauty and splendor and nothing, and they blew it. And then you, you fast forward to Abraham. Oh, you remember our journey through Abraham? Father Abraham, Father Abraham did some dumb stuff. Moses, you know Moses, after he led the people through the wilderness, didn't even get to go into the promised land. King David, whoa, whoa, whoa. And, and, and now we've got Peter, Peter who has spent the last three years in the very physical presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he blew it. So don't be so prideful. Don't be so arrogant as to think that you aren't capable of blowing it too. We all are. But for the grace of God, there's not one sin that we aren't capable of committing. But the beauty the beauty in the story of the Bible is a story of a loving, faithful God who is chasing down an unlovable, faithless, rebellious people. We mess up over and over again. And God, in his great love, he has provided a way for us to be restored, for us to be forgiven, for us to be cleansed and brought into his family. And that is through the completed work of what his son, Jesus Christ, did on the cross. And that is, that's what we're building up to here. This is the road that we are now on here in John 18. We have begun the journey down the long, hard road to the cross where the most brutal, most unreasonable, most horrific, yet oh so beautiful scene in all of history takes place. For it's in the horror of the cross that the price for our sin was paid. It's in the anguish of the cross that our debt was settled. Jesus paid it all. It's all to him I owe. My sin had left this crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the, but the blood of Jesus. It's a cross. It's this the horror of the cross that is the only hope that we have. We, we sang it just a little while ago. Oh, the cross of Jesus Christ is the reason I'm alive, for his blood has set me free. It will never lose its power for me. Man, I didn't, I, I didn't intend to recite lyrics to a bunch of songs this morning, but they're just, they're just flooding my mind as I think about what Jesus has done for you and for me, and oh, how I, how I understand what the hymn writer was talking about when he penned those words, so I'll cherish the old rugged cross. This horrific picture of the most brutal suffering of the most innocent man Mark, I cherish that cross. To my trophies at last I lay down. And I'll cling to that old rugged cross. You know why? It's the only hope I have. That's all I've got. This cross, this horrible, wonderful cross. So I'll cling to it. And I'll exchange it one day for a crown. See, Peter, he denied Jesus. And you know what? We have to. Maybe not in the same way that Peter has done it, but in our words, 
in our actions, in our attitudes, there's been moments when we've all denied him. Aren't you glad he's faithful? Aren't you glad that he's loving and gracious and forgiving? Aren't you thankful for the cross that makes it possible for us to be forgiven and restored? And I got to take a little side note here because before we close our time together this morning, I, I've got to speak just a minute about Jesus standing before Caiaphas because you see, unlike Matthew and Mark, John doesn't include the details of Jesus before Caiaphas. It's not in there. Just kind of skips right over it. He was sent from Caiaphas, and the next thing you see is he's going from Caiaphas to, to Pilate. So maybe, maybe John didn't think that he really needed to include these details because, I mean, we already know how it's going to go, right? I mean, yeah, Caiaphas is officially the high priest, but, but Annas is the one the controlling thing. He's the puppet master behind the scene, and he just wants Jesus dead. And, and, and if you look at Matthew and Mark's telling of that trial, sure enough, just as we all would expect, there's no justice. There's no, there's no pursuit of the truth. The verdict was already decided before they even had Jesus in custody. And when we pick back up next week, we're going to see Jesus carried from Caiaphas to Pilate for, for another mockery of a, child, of a trial. Pastor Mark is going to carry us into that next Sunday. But what we can see in Jesus as he stood before Annas and Caiaphas, although the details of him before Caiaphas are not covered in John, but what we can see in Jesus is his understanding of the world in which we live. Jesus knew that he would not receive justice from men. He knew that this world was polluted with sin and corruption. Jesus never expected justice from the courts, nor did he ever seek the approval of men. Instead, what we see in Jesus is the Son submitted himself to the will of the Father, and the Father allowed this injustice to take place and used it to advance his plan. Now understand, God is not the cause of injustice. God cannot sin God cannot be unjust, but God, being sovereign God, he can take anything and use it for his glory. And that's what we see take place in the arrest, trial, conviction, suffering, and death of Jesus Christ. God taking the evil actions of men, actions that they chose for themselves to do, but God used these actions of evil men to accomplish his purpose of making salvation available to mankind. What a God. You know, there are few things in life that are more challenging than enduring injustice. As I said earlier, because we bear the image of God, we have this inherent nature that longs for justice. But because we are sinful creatures, our idea of justice often is completely selfish. When we get outraged about something, we, we want resolution. We want things to change. We want action. When, when we've been wronged, we want retaliation. We want revenge. Our self-centered outlook, it begs for relief when, when we feel oppressed. And all the while, while we're suffering, while we're in misery, while, while we're being treated bad, or however it may show up, all the while, the world is watching, just sitting idly by with little to no concern. And you could be here today, and you know all too well what I'm talking about you've experienced this someone has slandered you and damaged your reputation gossip has caused division between you and someone that you once were very close to a false accusation could have changed the course of your entire life 
unfair punishment has fallen on you for something you didn't do or something you weren't responsible for. And if that's you, if you're facing any of those or, or, or a similar type situation, let me assure you, the Lord hears your cries for help and hope. And even though it may, may feel like it sometimes, he is not ignoring you and justice will one day be served. Remember what Romans 12, 19 says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. It may not, in fact, it probably won't be when and how you want it. But God has promised that justice will be served. Leave it to him. Let him fight the battle. Jesus never promised to keep us from the oppression and suffering of this world. Instead, what we see Jesus doing is we see him praying that we, we, we would be preserved through our trials, through our persecutions. We saw that back in chapter 17. And just like Jesus suffered injustice, the people of God, we should expect it in our lives. But as God's children, we have been promised unimaginable glory on the other side of our suffering. The agony that we suffer on this earth, though it feels overwhelming, it will one day give way to the victory of Christ. Hey, y'all. I've read the back of the book, and spoiler alert, we win. Church, one day, the Lord Jesus is going to return, and when he comes back, he won't be coming back as some meek and lowly servant like he did the first time. When he returns, he's coming back as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the ruler of heaven and earth, and on that day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Truth will reign supreme, and every just injustice will be vindicated. But in the meantime, submit your life to the plan and the purpose of God. Live for him. Speak his truth without apology and take comfort in the fact that no matter what we may face on this earth, our Savior understands our struggles and he will never leave us or forsake us. I am with you always, even to the very end. What a promise. Father, we, we are so thankful for the power of your word, for the truth of your word. Lord, and for this scene that has just been displayed before us, or that, 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 that touches on, on a number of things, God. We, we, we see in this scene Peter reflecting us in our failure in the times that, that we deny you when we sin, when we do wrong Lord I'm so thankful that it's not up to me I'm so thankful that I'm not hanging on to a knot at the end of a rope hoping I don't let go so thankful that the promise of your word is that I am held in the hand of Almighty God and there is no power in heaven or on earth that can pluck me from your hand. Thank you for that promise. That even when we are faithless, even when we are unlovable, you are faithful and love us anyway. And God, thank you for Jesus and for, of course, for, for his for His wonderful actions that he took on the cross to, to, to pay the price of our sin. God, thank you for that. Thank you for the plan of salvation that made a way. 
and thank you for what we've seen in Jesus, the example that he has set before us in our text today, Lord, that he stood for truth, not in a in an aggressive way, not in a in, in a insubordinate way, but God just stood for truth. Help us to speak the truth, to stand for truth, even if it does cause us to be slapped in the face. And in those days when we are oppressed, persecuted, slapped in the face, however it may appear, God, I pray that we would reflect the character of Christ and maintain our composure. Stay cool and calm and collected and speak with dignity, speak with integrity, and continue to speak truth. And God, I am... I, I am very aware of the reality that suffering is real in this world. And there are those in this room, those who are watching online, who have faced many struggles. They have been mistreated. They've been lied on. They've been cheated. They've been talked about, gossiped about. Had just, just all kinds of awful things that bring so much pain and suffering and torment into lives. God, I pray for each and every one of those individuals. God, I pray for your healing power to wash over their mind, their emotions, their spirit. God, just, just heal them. Bring them to a place of comfort and peace and forgiveness to those who have wronged them. Help them to trust in you, knowing that your promise is you will repay. Vengeance is yours. God, help us to walk in that promise that no matter what we face on this earth, you are ultimately in charge. You have the last say in all things. And one day as your people, all of the sufferings of this world won't matter anymore because they aren't even worth mentioning compared to the glory that is in store for us. God, help us to walk in that promise, walk in that hope that one day we will be with you forever. Thank you. We love you. We ask your blessings over us. As we close our time together, we sing this final song and uh, we go home for the day. And Lord, I pray that you give us opportunities to share the love of Jesus with someone this week. We ask it in his precious name. Amen.
Thank you, Becky. Go ahead and have a seat. Just a few announcements. Uh, the church office is closed tomorrow for Labor Day. So I hope everyone, if you have the day off, enjoy that time. And the River Kids Club starts this Wednesday. If you haven't registered, there's still time to register. You can go to our Facebook page or Facebook group and you can register. The cost uh, is 20 American dollars and that covers a beautiful t-shirt with the River Kids Club logo on it. Suitable for framing, but don't frame it because you got to wear it every week. Also, your kids get weekly snacks. I mean, 20 bucks, that's pretty good just for the snacks. I may come just for snacks. Snack time. Are y'all still awake? Okay, I just I didn't know if y'all nodded off there for a second. Uh, Discipleship Begins at Home Women's Conference will be live stream on September 9th and 10th. Those tickets also are $20, also include snacks, but you also get coffee, water, and lunch. So that sounds like a better deal, Zane. Oh, that's true. It's a one-time event. Why don't we raise the registration for the kids' club to 150 bucks? make you think like you're getting something of value. We're going to teach the kids all about Jesus every single Wednesday during the school year, so we're looking forward to that. September 11th, Pastor Mark is going to be hosting a new members class in his office right over yonder, and that's going to last four weeks, so you can go for September 11th all the way through October the 2nd. And even if you do not want to become a member, but you want to know more about our church, that is a great place to do it. But it is certainly one of the required steps towards membership. Also beginning September 11th, this is a, just a big September going on. There's a new Sunday school class for adult women. That'll be at 9.15 beginning on September 11th. Be studying the, uh, I was thinking Colossians, but that's something else coming up. Uh, so be prepared for that. If you have questions, see my lovely wife, Carrie. And then on September 15th begins the Colossians Bible study. That's where I was thinking about Colossians. Uh, that is going to be done through the Zoom room. Nine lesson class. If you have questions about either of those, see Carrie. If you have questions about new members, see Mark. If you have questions about the river, see Zane. If you have any other questions, Google it. Let's stand. We'll be dismissed. I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of the weekend. What's up? What about it? What? Huh? Oh, you're having a meeting. You're just now saying that? I forgot. So there's a meeting of the River Kids Club workers will be in the Fellowship Hall that... At your house? Right now. I mean, just go there right this second. In the fellowship hall. Uh, also, I forgot. I, I remember Debbie. I see Debbie saying, I remembered. That wasn't at all what I was trying to remember when I came in the sanctuary this morning. I have no idea what that was about. Uh, but on September 25th, we're going to have a spaghetti fellowship after church uh, at about noontime when we finish up. It's called Spaghetti to Know You. Because that's see how the play, and we're going to... So you come, and if you have questions about that, see Debbie, and Debbie will hook you up. Everybody is welcome to come to that. That is September 25th. Man, we're not going to have time for October. We're just going to be all tapped out. Uh, so a lot of stuff going on. Keep up with it in your current or on our Facebook, in our Facebook group. You can keep up with everything that's going on. I think that is all. And don't forget Converge Youth this afternoon at 5 o'clock. Don't, just forget what I just said. <laughs> should have quit while I was, ahead. I thought I was going to, I should have planned to be sick today. That's what I should have done. All right, we'll pray. Let's pray. That I can do. Father, we are grateful, Lord, to be here. Lord, just gather together to worship through the common bond that is found in Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray as we leave this place, our worship would not stop in this building but Lord, that we would demonstrate the love of Christ to a world that desperately needs to hear the hope that is found in the cross that Pastor Zane preached about this morning. So Father, I pray as always that we would be doers of God's word and not hearers only. In Jesus' name, amen.